Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics, and today you are in for a treat because I'm going to be showing you what I'm calling the Clip to Zero production strategy. This is a follow up to the series that I did about uh, achieving competitive loudness and my two follow up videos about clippers. This is pretty much going to be the fourth video in the series, and it's going to be wrapping up pretty much everything I ever wanted to say about uh, mastering and loudness and techniques for achieving competitive loudness in some of the more difficult genres uh, that, that perplex all newer producers. <laughs> like, how do I get that loud and stay clean? So what I'm going to be showing you today is effectively my very formalized approach. Uh, I've fine-tuned this. I I've been working in a fuzzy way towards this for a long time as I've become more comfortable with my mastering techniques and my mastering knowledge. Uh, and it's pretty much formalized now. It's pretty much cooked. I really took time to road test this on a bunch of new projects. Um, the one that I've published uh, recently is under a new artist persona, so my alter ego, if you will, called Dubscald. And uh, you can go check this out if you want um, on all the major platforms. It's up everywhere. Just search for Dubscald. And uh, you can hear the technique I'm about to show you used on this song. And uh, you know, maybe that'll give you a little confidence that I know what I'm talking about here. So uh, the deal with this strategy, well, actually, before I jump into it, let me just give you a little teaser to whet your appetite. Here are two masters of a short little four-bar drop segment, just a quick and dirty, quickest demo possible without any fuss or muss. And one of them's done the old school way. And the other one's done with my clip to zero method, my CTZ method, right? So <clears throat> waveforms look about the same. You can see that the, the kicks and snares are kind of predominant. They're poking up a little bit above the fatter uh, baseline that's obviously going on there. That's, that's largely because this is a really dry artificial example with nothing except the kick, the snare, and basically a simple bass chop loop with about four different bass sounds in it. There are no atmospheric sounds running alongside this. There's nothing to, to add a serious amount of high end. There's no hats, no cymbals, none of the usual stuff you would have in a real drop, right? To like really fill out the spectrum and really like add a lot of energy here. So this is like really pushing the limits of, of how to get loud numbers with a very simple kick snare and just a four bar, I'm sorry, a four voice bass chop kind of sound. So. First, we're going to hear the old school example. Then we're going to hear the CTZ example. We're going to see what loudness they each hit. And then uh, we're going to normalize them to basically be the same relative loudness and then jump back and forth and A, B, compare them. So prepare to have your mind blown a little bit. All right, so here's the old school example. It's the only one that's playing right now. <laughs> Okay, and you can see that uh, it's hitting an integrated loudness. That means like for all the time I was playing it, the average Luff's value has been negative 9.2, which is a lot of people would consider that loud, but that's not competitive loud. That's not, this type of music is usually at least seven luffs or louder, and sometimes songs in this genre will drop all the way down to maybe negative eight luffs if, if you can't push it all the way to at least seven, but most, most people shoot for hitting at least negative seven integrated loudness, but this one's only hitting negative 9.2. The loudest it ever gets in short term is negative 8.5, and the loudest it ever hits momentary is negative 7.4. Now, it's worth noting, these songs are both mastered to a really conservative true peak value. The limiter was set to, to have a ceiling of negative one true peak, which is kind of the recommended thing if you're going to be pushing the song out to streaming platforms and they go through lossy transcoding. 
Uh, if you've got more than negative one true peak, you're likely to get even more intersample peaks and clipping that happens when your wave file is transcoded down to a lossy format for the streaming platforms. Now, as I've said in my previous videos about mastering and clipping and loudness, most producers and mastering engineers and record labels don't care about true clip at all. They will let it go right up into the positive numbers above zero. And they're doing that in part to squeeze out every last bit of loudness possible because the more you try and squash, the more you kill the sound and break things apart, especially softening up the kick and the snare and all that stuff too much. So anyway, point is, in the old days, I used to, I used to basically not even worry about true peak. I would turn it off. My limiter wouldn't even try to limit to true peak. I would just limit to zero dBFS ceiling sample peak and to hell with whatever true peak said. But I'm being aggressive and showing you true peak here because <laughs> number one, there is a lot of logic to it, and it does make sense if you're if you're concerned about not having your song distort any more than absolutely necessary when it's tossed onto all the streaming platforms. But uh, when I did this recent tune, right? Um, I did master this one to negative one true peak because this one was not built for DJs. This was built specifically for streaming audiences and the way people listen in streaming playlists. So the reason this is an alter ego dub scald and not bathymetrics is because this isn't strictly my older style of hard festival oriented bass music. It's still very much electronic dance music, but it's more chill, it's more down tempo, and I wasn't trying to shoot for competitive loudness of negative seven luffs or louder. This was done at about negative 10 luffs on the drops. And it still sounds great, and it still sounds loud, and it still sounds bright, but it's, it's definitely geared towards uh, the streaming platforms. But anyway, that was the old school one. Let's listen to the CTZ one now. Um, so you're going to see this one's hitting an integrated loudness of negative 7.3. <laughs> Okay, uh, and it didn't sound that much different than the other one, maybe a tinch louder. If I were to play them back and forth, you'd hear a very small difference in loudness. But let's just go ahead and, and move along and normalize these both to the same integrated loudness. So this uh, little plugin here, if you don't know about it, it's called um, DP Meter 4. It's by a company called TB, DB, TB <laughs> Pro Audio. Uh, it's a guy in Bavaria, Germany. And um, it's free. I recommend you get it because it's fantastic. You're going to see me using it all over this project. I think it's one of those weird must-have utility programs. So go find this because it's awesome. So what I'm going to do is see I've measured the LUFs. And these little M buttons you see will automatically change the gain level based on whatever reference level I put in here. So what I've said is I want to I want to reference these down to negative 12 of something. Now what is that? I could I could reference it down to negative 12 true peak by clicking this button. I could reference it to negative 12 short term lefts by clicking this button or negative 12 momentary max by clicking this button. But what I want to do is is normalize them both to negative 12 integrated to match effectively YouTube levels of streaming, right? Which is one of the better targets to shoot for. Uh, so I click this button, I click this button, it resets the meters, it has gained the louder CTZ track down by negative 4.7, and it's gained down the quieter old school track down to 2.9. So now these are gonna read exactly the same loudness. They're gonna be pretty much essentially each negative 12 LUFs integrated. So what I'm going to do now is flip back and forth A, B, so you can hear what they sound like at the same loudness compared to each other. And since I turned everything down, let's crank up, let's see, three. Let's kick this up by 3 dB so they're still the same relative loudness. <laughs> Okay. 
okay, you can hear they're effectively identical, right? You can barely hear any differences. I'm almost certain you, you can't hear any differences over YouTube. Let's just play the first part a couple times really quickly and bounce back and tweet between them so you can kind of get a feel for the difference. <laughs> Right? They're both clean. They're both good. And yet, this one was a full two luffs louder. It was almost at like the perfect threshold, I think, for competitive loudness that will stand up against anything else in a, a festival-oriented DJ set, uh, a live club environment. It's going to have the same feeling of density and saturation and hotness as anything else out there, even, even ridiculously loud bangers that don't need to be louder than seven luffs integrated, right, across your loudest drop, like I've talked about in my previous videos. The point is, this was as far as I could push the master the old school way. If I get rid of these values again, I'm going to just let the gain be normally what they were. Let's run them one more time. Let's drop this back to zero. <laughs> Right? So, you know, roughly in the negative nine and a half range versus the negative seven and a half range, that's a huge difference in, in loudness. And yet they sounded effectively the same. Um, in other words, I can point out two things about that. Number one, the differences can be subtle. If we really, if you were really listening to this on the speakers without headphones at full volume with your subwoofer and your sub pack and everything else, you would notice some significant differences. A little bit more hotness, a little bit more energy, a little bit more density in this 7.2, 7.3 LUFS version, right? Um, but this also shows you, you don't have to be that paranoid about loudness really in the long run because even though this is only down at negative 9.3 it still sounds effectively the same right the differences are subtle so you know whenever you think just because my favorite bass music artist puts out masters that are like negative seven or negative six luffs or even louder you don't necessarily have to do that to be in the ballpark, right? There is a certain threshold right around, I think, right around negative nine to negative 10, um, where things start feeling like they don't belong in the same playlist, mixed in the same set. And that threshold is right around negative 9.4, 6, somewhere in there. If you can get above nine and a half, you're really close to rock and roll. But the closer you can get to seven, the denser your mix has to be, the lower the dynamic range, which it effectively forces you to increase the density of the mix. And there's just a certain density and hotness and sound that comes from that heavy amount of dynamic range compression you have to do to hit a loudness target like this that puts you in the same ballpark as everything else. And that makes your stuff predictable for a DJ who's mixing in and out of other songs. But, you know, I went into lots of depth on that in some of those previous videos, so I won't berate the point too much here. The point is, yes, you can do it. Yes, there's an easy way to do it. I'm gonna teach you the easy way to do it without tearing your sound apart, because that's the other thing. You might normally try and master a song the old school way that you're taught on YouTube, right? And you might be able to get here and you go, well, it's pretty good. But if you try and push it any louder, everything starts falling apart. The kick starts softening up and getting mushy. The snare just fades into the background and gets masked. Um, everything starts falling apart. Harsh resonances pop up. Just the whole mix starts falling apart when you try and crush it past a point like this. And you can't get here without just completely breaking up your mix and, and ruining it, right? So. The technique I'm going to show you is how to get here with the least amount of damage possible in a very predictable, very repeatable way, right? And going back to the slides for a minute, 
the main point I want to make about this is that this strategy is going to work for you at any loudness target you want to work at. This isn't just for the super loud bass music guys and girls, right? This is something that will work even for, you know, my song here, which wasn't meant to be that loud. This is down around negative 10, right? Um, and yet I use this technique. It works perfectly. It's just completely transferable no matter what loudness target you like to work at, right? So let's briefly talk about this. You know, I, I've heard respected mastering engineers, engineers I like, throw out a phrase and I hear other people repeat it on YouTube saying, it's really kind of wrong to think about target loudness. You just shouldn't think that way. You should only think about making the mix as good as possible and as loud as possible while still being good. And don't worry about the targets, right? And I hear that repeated and it's, it's nice for people who struggle with the loudness thing. <laughs> it's kind of wrong though. It really is wrong because I, I don't care who you are and what level you tend to work out before you get to mastering you do have some sort of loudness target in mind, right? Even if you're a professional mastering engineer, your client is gonna be telling you, I want it to be as loud as this thing over here, or I need it to be as loud as the other things in my genre, or this band, or this artist, right? Everyone has an idea of how loud it needs to be. Even the mastering engineers, if they're, if they're mastering something for CDs, they're looking for target values right around negative nine to negative six, somewhere in there, right? If you only ever care about putting your stuff out on the streaming platforms and you want to have as much dynamic range as possible because you work in a quiet genre like jazz or orchestral or whatever, and you really want that wide dynamic range and you actually make use of it, well then you might want to, you know, actually master to negative 14 or negative 12 lefts or even negative 16 for Apple Music, right? iTunes. And... Um, you know, that would be important to you is to make full use of that dynamic range available to you at this quiet target, right? And then, of course, for, you know, the bass heads and the festival people and the club people and the DJs, most of the time that target is at least negative seven, maybe going down to negative eight or just a little over, a little under negative eight, right? A little quieter, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5. If you can't push it any farther, but most of us try to shoot for at least negative seven. And it's only if, if everything falls apart at negative seven, we back off and just say, okay, it's close enough. Because like I showed you, you can go down even like to negative nine, negative 9.2, negative 9.3, and it's still kind of in the ballpark, right? It won't sound that bad, sandwiched between two louder, hotter songs, right? You might notice it, but the audience won't notice it, right? So everyone's got a target in mind. Don't ever think you don't have a target. And this strategy lets you basically pick a target and work towards that target, right? Um, now, the other thing that's interesting about this is that the old school way of working, everyone teaches you pick a pretty low working level, like your loudest sound peaking at negative 12 dB or peaking at negative 18 dB or peaking at negative 23 lefts short term, right? I mean, really quiet, low, low levels, right? They say, look, it's digital. You don't have to worry about the noise floor. Just work at the standard level, right? And so the, the numbers you hear thrown around a lot are like negative 12 peak and negative 18 RMS, right? And so some people will work there. They'll, they'll like set their loudest sounds at negative 12 and they'll mix everything up into the framework of those loudest sounds, and their whole mix is really running at like negative 18 luffs or negative 20 luffs or negative 16 or 17 luffs the whole time. And then they get to mastering, right? Final mix down and mastering, and they try to push up towards these targets, and everything goes to hell. And they, they pull their hair out, and all sorts of things need to be fixed and tweaked because you were never working at your target loudness in the first place. So you never could hear everything that was wrong at the target loudness, okay? Especially if you're a bass music person trying to push for this much loudness, right? You work at, at negative 12 peak on your kick and snare and level everything against that. And you get to mastering and say, now I need to push for negative seven. And you tear your hair out 
and can't do it and give up and stop at negative 8.5 or whatever because there's just way too many unexpected things that happen when you push for loudness at the last minute. You're going to start hearing harsh resonances pop up that were originally masked in that wider dynamic range when you didn't care about squeezing up the dynamic range to hit a loud target like this. All these nasty resonances start popping up, right? And you got to go fix them. Other thing, sounds are going to fall apart because their transients are squashed more than they can handle. Kick drums are famous for this, right? Your kick just softens up instantly if you push it too hard, and it starts sounding flubby and tubby and flabby and rubbery, and it doesn't have that punch and snap or, or boom and thud and impact you want, right? And then the other big thing that happens is all the sounds that were perfectly leveled when you were in your mix-down phase, still working at like negative... 17 luffs or negative 18 luffs, all those sounds that were perfectly leveled, when you squeeze that dynamic range, they've all suddenly become proportionally much louder than before compared to the, the top of your mix. And so all of these sounds that were originally at the perfect spot during your mix down are now suddenly way too loud. And you have to go back and pull down faders once you've got your whole mastering chain engaged. And it's just like... You know, I went through this for years. I thought it was normal. I'd ask my own mentors about it. They'd say it's normal. Well, I don't think it's normal. I mean, it's normal because we all do it, but I think there's a better way. And I'm going to show you the better way because this CTG, this <laughs> clip to zero strategy helps you avoid all these surprises at the end because you're working effectively at your target loudness the entire time you start a project. I mean, literally from the beginning. I'm going to demo that to you. Okay, so... Again, the, the whole point of this strategy and the, the reason it's working for me and the reason I want to take time to show you is it really takes away all the surprises, regardless of your target loudness level, right? From the very start, you're able to hear and measure everything pretty much almost exactly at your target loudness. Yeah, I know that sounds like a bold claim, but I'm going to prove that to you, okay? It gives you much more confidence in the sound choices, like which samples should I be pulling in? Are these, is this kick and snare going to actually work by the time I crush this up to my full target loudness, right? Or are they going to fall apart and I have to go find entirely new kick and snare samples? Which, by the way, happens a lot when you work the old school way, especially in the bass music world. Um, and it just in general enables you to have a kind of fail fast decision making. You might try out a synth patch and because the whole project is effectively running right at the target loudness and that synth patch just can't get there because by the time you push it up into the same level, relative level as everything else, it, it's just like it, it won't get loud enough. And if you try and make it loud enough, it falls apart. And so crap, you got to go find another synth because that one's just not going to work. Or the same for any sample or whatever, right? You can fail fast because you're going to identify those sounds that just can't be pushed loud much faster, right? You'll find them the minute you try to pull them into the project. So this is, to me, a really huge benefit and helps you get through the process a lot faster. Okay. Um, now, there is a caveat about the strategy. It only works for people that work 100% in the box. It's not for engineers and hybrid studios that use outboard analog gear. And that's because most analog gear out there is optimized for signals that are running at negative 18 RMS, especially the older vintage analog gear, all the famous compressors you hear about and famous equalizers and whatever. They do, because of the physics of analog circuitry, most of them actually do truly need the signal to be running around negative 18 RMS on average, maybe peaking, and that usually equates to a peak of negative 12. And that's why you hear that common advice when you're starting out to set your loudest sounds at negative 12 and just work there. Because not that long ago, a lot of producers, certainly a lot of engineers, would work on your project by sending a lot of that signal outside of the box into analog gear and then bringing it back into the computer, into the DAW. And a, a lot of engineers still work that way today. They have their favorite outboard gear. They spend a lot of money on it. They know what it sounds like. They know how to use it. It's good. It, it imparts a great sound. So all the pro mastering engineers and mixing engineers watching this, yes, of course, you probably already figured it out, but this ain't going to work for you because this requires you to stay in the box 100%. And the reason for that is because the DAWs 
run everything at at least 32-bit float signal depth. And so what that means is um, you can get really, really loud above zero. And also almost all of the DAW native devices and VSTs made for use in DAWs, all the modern VSTs, certainly the modern synthesizers, the modern effects processors, the modern compressors, etc., they don't care what level the signal is. You can, you can often feed a signal that's at zero or over zero into them, and they'll handle it just fine because their internal algorithm is a linear kind of algorithm. It does linear processing. Whereas certain VST plugins, like, for example, most of the emulations of the SSLG bus compressor or um, the 1176 or... You know, the LA2, the LA3, uh, the PugTech um, EQs, all those things um, are modeled to expect and work best if you feed a signal that's negative 18 into them, right? So you still sometimes have to gain stage down to the level of some vintage plugin you might want to use, but then you can gain stage right up afterwards just by using little utility plugins. But the point is, as far as the DAW is concerned, you can safely work at or above zero on any given track. And even any bus that leads all the way up to your final master bus or mix bus, depending on what your DAW calls it, right? The only real rule for working in the box is you don't ever want to go over zero on your master bus, your mix bus. I mean, I know you see your favorite producers sometimes show that they did do that and they're they know what they're doing, maybe. <laughs> they're clipping, right? It will clip out of your DAW, and you will hear the clipping on your speakers when you do that, right? And they're, they're actually clipping it on purpose because, for whatever reason, they want that clipped sound, and that's cool, and it's a way for them to flex and show how cool they are, right? But really, most of the time, you just the only golden rule is keep your master at zero or below. Don't let it go in the red, right? That's just safer unless you know what you're doing and you want to flex and you want to play around, right? But all your individual tracks and buses leading up to the master, they could go in the red. And if you watch your favorite producer's work, you'll see that often they've got entire tracks and buses going in the red and they don't care. And they don't need to care because nothing's actually clipping, right? That's the way 32-bit and 64-bit float summing points work. But, but... Even though you can do it, it adds an element of unpredictability. It makes it a little harder to predict what's happening to your signal as it moves up towards the master. And so this clip to zero strategy, part of that is keeping everything right at zero, not above zero, right? So you're going to see as I, show, as I demo this, every single track stays at zero or below, never goes above zero. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, how does this work? Why does it work? We're gonna to have to cover a few little basics just, to, just so that everything I talk about when I'm demoing this to you <laughs> will make sense. So just a couple quick basics, bear with me here. In order to hit some fairly competitive and aggressive loudness target, right? You have to fill up a bunch of dimensions. I'm gonna use a really generic term. There's a bunch of dimensions to, to, to music. In, in the engineering sense. And I think the easiest way to talk about those dimensions, you'll hear people talk about front to back sound stage depth, but I don't think that plays as much into the loudness factor. So I don't have depth listed here, but I think the main dimensions for loudness can be broken down into four basic groups. There's just the sheer RMS of a sound, right? Anything that makes more RMS than peaks, like saturation will raise the RMS without raising the peaks too much or at all. Clipping will raise the RMS and keep the peaks right where they are, right? Um, parallel compression, parallel saturation, uh, upward compression. There's a lot of things that will take the quieter parts of the signal where, where all the RMS is, all the loudness, and just push them up towards the peaks, right? Without also raising the peaks at all or maybe just not by as much. Like if you can raise the RMS by four, but only raise the peak by one, well, that's pretty good. You've, you've just increased the loudness of that signal, right? 
because you're always limited by the ceiling of your signal, signal path, right? Your, once your peaks hit that ceiling, if they go through the ceiling above zero, you start getting clipping, right? On the master anyway, right? And the idea then is to get your peaks to touch whatever ceiling you want to have, but to raise the RMS up into that without also pushing the peaks over the ceiling. So RMS is the biggie. Now, um, you do this by using anything that raises RMS more than it does peaks. You also can clip or limit, use a clipper or a limiter. They're effectively the same thing as I've talked about in previous videos. Subtle nuance difference between them, but effectively they're both kind of clippers. And they shave off the peaks. And the whole point is you can shave off, in many cases, some of the peak. And it's completely inaudible. Like, you can't tell any difference because you shave those peaks, right? And that's what we're looking for in this process is a combination of anything that raises RMS more than the peaks, plus also applying some clipping or limiting of those inaudible peaks. And you do those two things and you get a really low crest factor and a really high RMS. And crest factor is just that ratio of RMS or loudness to peaks. Uh, a high RMS is really high peaks and low loudness and a low crest factor, I'm sorry, I meant to say crest factor, a low crest factor is very high RMS and very small peaks, like little tiny spikes and not huge caterpillar-like spines, right? Okay. Now, another way to get to loudness is by manipulating your time dimension. Uh, specifically, the simplest way, and this is what every bass music producer does in their drops, right, is instead of layering a bunch of low RMS but high crest factor sounds on top of each other, you know, peaky pokey sounds and you layer three or four of them together, you get this mess because all those peaks sum together and now your crest factor is even bigger than before in the total summed signal, right? So that's a bad way to go if your goal is loudness. Um, so what bass music producers are famous for is they will take really high RMS sounds and sequence them so that slices of those high RMS sounds sit side by side and never layer with each other or barely layer with each other. They barely overlap. And so it's just like a huge block followed by a huge block followed by a huge block. And so all those blocks are really super loud. And so the whole sequence of time is really super loud. And that's how you get big, loud, fat drops. And I'm going to show you that. Well, you heard that in the demo. That was a kick, snare, and four bass sounds, all pretty loud, all high RMS, sequenced together side by side, right? So that's a big thing we do. And then part of this checkerboarding is to also, you know, there, there's times when you can't avoid sounds layering together, but we can manage that in several ways. And one of those ways is by ducking two layered sounds against each other. In other words, if your kick is hitting and you crush all the bass, all the, all the mid bass sounds all the way to the floor while that kick happens, you've effectively checkerboarded the kick and the bass, right? They're not layering or summing together. Okay, so that's another big thing. And then, again, there are always things that do need to be layered. It is music, layered sounds are great. But when you do layer sounds, when you have to layer them, usually in the more melodic portions of bass music. Um, you want to give every layered sound its own area of the spectrum, right? If, if you put three full spectrum sounds on top of each other, they're all going to sum up really huge, right? But if you take those three sounds and you give one of them the low end of the spectrum, you give the other one the middle of the spectrum, and you give the third one the high end of the spectrum, now all of a sudden they're not summing anymore. It's almost like a kind of checkerboarding, but across the spectrum, right? So manipulating your spectrum that way, doing what uh, I've heard called EQ slotting, slotting your, your sounds together so they each own a certain part of the spectrum but don't overlap with each other. You know, that's related to this. And also the concept of masking. Uh, we've got a lot of tools lately that show you when one sound is masking another sound. And, the, you know, you can see it in a kind of red color in certain tools, right? And again, if you reduce the masking, you're effectively checkerboarding the spectrum. 
right? So that sounds happening at the same time, each occupy their own spot. And then finally, the stereo field is another place we get loudness. I mean, this is a basic one, everyone knows this, but if you, if you put two sounds right in the center, they're gonna fight with each other and cover each other up. But if you put one sound in the center and spread the other one wide out into the sides, that's, that sound in the sides will suddenly sound much louder than before because it's not fighting with the other sound in the center. So manipulating your stereo field uh, is another way to spread things out and be able to pull the actual physical levels of a sound down a little bit and still keep it as relatively loud as before because now it's out in the side and nothing else is competing with it out there. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the checkerboarding because sometimes you need to see that in action to, to really understand it and believe it. This is a um, simple project with a kick and snare drum loop, a matching top loop, and a pink noise. Now these look bigger, but I've put uh, this tool on it and done some gaining so that all three of these tracks are all ex at exactly negative 12 peak, okay? So you'll notice that a lot of these transient uh, hi-hat type sounds are overlapping the kick and the snare. As I go along, they're like, they're gonna sum with the kick and the snare. So let's look at this kick real, real quick. Um, and let's go to the summed. And we're gonna use an oscilloscope here and I've got these two tracks muted. So we're only seeing the kick and snare and this is what it looks like in an oscilloscope. And I'm not gonna play it loud because the sound here doesn't matter. You can probably barely hear that. Um, but there's your kick and your snare. Kick, snare. Not a great kick, not a great snare, just random, random things I pulled in. And here's the top loop. Okay. So you can see how high the top loop is hitting on the meter, and you can see how high the kick and snare is hitting on the, the meter, right? So kick and snare are bounded by this line and this line. Now watch what happens when we sum them together. See how the kick is now up above this second line? Turn it off again. Sum them together again. And let's also make sure I do not have any ducking on. Yes, my duck is off. So <clears throat> you can see that these spikes, when they hit with the kick, they make the kick bigger. And that's a problem because again, you're trying to keep dynamic range low and RMS high. And, and Every time you sum things together and make the peaks go higher than before, that becomes a problem at the end when limiters and clippers have to crush those peaks back down to get dynamic range, okay? So just with the kick and the, and the top loop together, let's turn on a ducker here in the um, top loop. And this is what the ducking curve looks like. And now we're gonna go look at this again in the oscilloscope and watch how the kick stays here now, even though we're summing both of these together, or it stays really close to this line. Right, it's staying right here at the second line because this ducking slice is taking care of that overlap between the transient here and the transient of the kick at the same time, right? So ducking, like I was showing you in that slide, can help to kind of checkerboard the sound. And the whole trick is to just play with your ducking envelope until it sounds natural, and you're getting as much of the effect you want while still sounding natural. Uh, so watch what happens as I change the shape and length of the ducking slice. Watch what happens over here. Um, Actually, before I show you what it looks like when it looks different, let me also bring in the pink noise because I set these up really carefully to show you the kind of results you can achieve. So here we're gonna add pink noise to the mix. Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna turn this way down because the pink noise is really irritating. Again, we're just really caring about what the meters say. Right? 
So now we have pink noise in the mix, and there's already a ducker on for the top loop, but there's no ducker on for the pink noise. So again, because this pink noise is adding all this energy at the same time as this transient and this transient, it's adding and making the kick and snare poke up again, and it's also um, almost making some of these uh, transients here kick up a little bit too. Mostly though, you see it poking up on the kick and the snare, right? But if we come in here to the pink noise and we also turn on a ducker and set it, and it has a very similar looking ducking slice because this just has to do with the, the shape and sound and timbre and length of the kick and snare themselves, watch what happens to the summed signal now. We're gonna see the kick and snare staying much closer to this second line again. Right? There are a few peaks that kick up above this second line, but again, look at the difference between them. I'm just gonna turn this ducker on and off. Uh, don't have an easy one in the interface itself, so let's just come back over here. Off again. Actually, let me do this. Let's make it faster. So we got the ducker off. We're gonna look at the summing. So here's without the duck on the pink noise. Look how high so many of those peaks from the kick and the snare are sitting way up here. And if we turn the ducker on again on the pink noise, see how much lower those peaks are now? So here's the deal. Let's get to some peaks. Right? A few peaks are sticking up above that second line but they're fairly small, fairly far apart. And the point of this demonstration is to show that a certain amount of ducking, in other words, checkerboarding over time, these three sounds that all have to happen together, right? You can get the peaks down, which effectively makes the RMS louder. It makes the crest factor better, right? And then the few peaks that are still poking up above whatever ceiling you might want, like let's say this line here represented our ceiling, now I don't have to clip or limit nearly as much, right? Because I allowed these loud sounds to be placed side by side more, and only a little bit of overlap and interaction is happening now compared to before. Again, if I turn off the ducker, look how much higher it sits. Right? If I'm not doing ducking, now my clipper limiter has to shave all those peaks and it's, it's shaving peaks for a longer period of time, which makes the distortion from the shaved peaks more obvious, right? And so things start falling apart. Um, and I'm gonna show you a better example of that in just a second. So the point is, do as much checkerboarding as you can with your ducking and your sequencing and your arranging of sounds, right? And then even when you do that, you're still gonna have a few peaks that poke up above uh, everything. So let's turn on the ducker again and let's find a peak that's poking up. Okay, so like if my clipper, you, you're, the point is you're still gonna have to use a clipper. You're still gonna have to limit, right? You, you can't perfectly fix um, your time dimension with duckers. You can improve it, but you can't, make a perfect hard ceiling through ducking. But the point is, use your duckers and then make it easier for your clippers to do a lot less work, for your limiters to do a lot less work, and then you'll have an easier time. So that's, that's I guess, let's go back to the uh, drum loop for a s the top loop for a second and show you what happens with the different, um, the different, shapes you might have for the duck, just to kind of show you how this works. So <clears throat> we're going to watch it in this oscilloscope, and I'm just going to change the curve and change this and watch how, let's turn off the pink noise too. So right now we're keeping the kick and the snare pretty much at this second line, right? But as I drag this around, watch how the, the the peaks that I'm controlling really well start poking higher up. OK, 
Okay, so the point is, don't just pick a traditional looking ducking shape like this and assume everything's fine. You have to use your ear. You also have to use your eye. Look at the combined signal in an oscilloscope. I've talked about this in previous videos, especially my video about ducking. <laughs> and then play with seemingly longer, non-traditional looking ducking envelopes while you listen and find the spot where your ears tell you that the two sounds are seamlessly overlapping and next to each other and feel really good and you don't hear pumping or sucking or gaps. But also use your eyes and look for what shape is giving you the best crest control, right? The best control over that, that signal. Sometimes a really weird, long, non-traditional looking ducking shape like this is actually better, right? Use your ears and your eyes in an oscilloscope. Okay, let's move on to the next example. So the other thing about using clippers that is easy to, uh, easy to not grasp at first is clippers work best when they don't have to do a lot of work, just like limiters work best when they don't have to do a lot of work. This is the actual unprocessed kick sample that I used in the project, the demo project I'm gonna show you. And it's an overcompressed, hyper squashed sample straight out of the sample pack. And this is what sample pack makers do. They make something that looks more like this in kick two or whatever, however they like to make their kicks and snares. They make something that looks like this and sounds really good. And then they compress the hell out of it and give you the burned compressed copy because it sounds big and fat, makes you go, oh my God, those are big, heavy kicks, I love them, right? Let's buy that sample pack. Problem is, this is worthless in a mix. This is one of the best things I ever learned from some of my early mentors, teaching me some ups and downs, right? Kicks like this, snares like this, terrible. They will fall apart at target loudness because what this kind of kick shape here is forcing the, the clipper or limiter to do is come along, and shave a whole bunch of peaks for a whole long length of time, and it makes this big, loud spat of constant distortion that quickly masks the original sound of the kick. It starts sounding tubby, fluffy, mushy, poopy, crappy, dead, flabby, and, and staticky, right? Um, instead, what you often have to do with kicks in your sample packs is reshape them to look like a regular good kick again. And what makes this triangular, I always call that the Dorito. It looks like a Dorito chip on its side, right? Good kicks and good snares tend to look like this. Um, because this allows a clipper or limiter to shave a little tiny bit off the first peak. Well, actually a lot off the first peak, but then a little bit less off the second one. Let's zoom in a little bit. Right? You know, the clipper comes along and let's say the ceiling is right about where the top of my little I-beam is, right? These first peaks it has to shave a lot off of. And then it's shaving a little less there, a little less there, a little less there, a little less there, and even less there, and so on. And so the point is, because it's spreading out the work and it only makes the first initial impact the biggest impact, and that's on a very high frequency sound, the transient high frequency sound, and it's barely cutting into, you know, the deeper, more pitched tonal sounds in the, in the body drop of the kick, the pitch drop of the kick. Because it's working less by the time it gets to those because of this shape, it's cleaner and more transparent. So let's show you what that sounds like. Let's listen to it real quick. So here's the um, good sounding kick. And up here on the group, I have a clipper and a limiter. And we're going to, oops, let's activate that again. And oh, I have to activate the audio engine, right? OK, so we'll turn on the clipper first, and we'll see what clipping does. And I'm doing exactly 6.3 dB of clipping. And you're going to be able to see it here as the little spikes that extend past the top and bottom edges here. So again, we're just playing this top Dorito shaped kick. Right, that's with the clipper on. This is with the clipper off. Right, you can hear it's changing the, the timbre a little bit, but not that much. Now, let's hear that same clipper being applied to this kick instead. 
hear how it's starting to sound boingy and springy and flabby and tubby? Let's flip back and forth between them. Right? I mean, that's all you need to hear. <laughs> It's a huge difference because this kind of shape cannot survive clipping or limiting to an extreme amount, right? The kind of amount you typically have to do to get into competitive loudness, right? Uh, and lest you think it's somehow a defect of clippers, let's turn off the clipper and let's go use a mastering limiter on the same, same exact trick. Again, it's doing exactly 6.3 dB of gain. So... Here's the good kick. Here's the bad kick. Let's jump back and forth between them. Okay. I think you get the point. So... When you are working on a project, although it's not strictly part of the CTZ method I'm about to show you, just be really aware that if you have big, long, fat, sausage-shaped sections of any kind of sound, they're not going to do very well when you try to clip and limit them and apply some of these techniques to get their RMS louder than before, right? First, you're going to have to apply some sort of transient shaping. And you can do this with compressors. You can do this with transient shapers. Let's show you how this works on this kick real quick. Uh, I'm going to put a transient shaper on here. Let's use the kilohertz one because it's my favorite. All right. Let's also make sure this bad boy is off. Okay. So we're just going to see this... Um, squashed kick, and I'm also going to put in an oscilloscope. Okay. All right. So you can see the kick down here looks pretty much the same as the kick here. Let's see if I can get it spread out to the same whip. Okay. And let's also blow this window up so we can just see it a little bit bigger. Let's also turn off mid and side. There we go. Okay. So most transient shapers work by either pushing the transient up or pushing the sustain up, or you can leave the transient where it is and pull the sustain down. So this kind of visually represents it as it does this sort of wave shaper, waveform thing here, right? Sustain up, sustain down. Now what I like about the kilohertz one is it has this section in the middle called pump. And pump is really good because if you raise the pump, you don't push the transient up, but you still make the transient sharper, right? That's what pump is for. So here's what it looks like in action. See how making the, the transient attack louder makes it peakier and more Dorito-like, but it also pushes it up above its original ceiling. Right? It's a good shape, but it's louder than before. So, if I instead increase the pump, right? This is the only transient shape I've ever seen that does this. It's fantastic. Okay, so if, you, if you're lucky enough to have kilohertz stuff, this is super. Um, now, there's other ways to get this. Uh, you can also just put a compressor like, um, this is the SSLG bus compressor. Um, it, it's nice because it, 
It only goes up to an attack length of 30 milliseconds, and that's typically what you want. And you typically want uh, a ratio of 4 or 10 and a fairly short release time. And then you set the threshold, and you're going to see when this is... Let's take the threshold all the way off. Okay, so there's our big kick. Oh, let's turn off the makeup gain. Now, if I drop the threshold, look at that. Let's turn it off. Uh, let's turn off the clipper too. Oop, let's also turn up the wet. Let's freeze that. So why does that work? Why does a simple compressor work? Well, okay, so the threshold is basically set to right about here or here, right around here. And it's taking 30 milliseconds from the time it's triggered with that very first transient to slowly carve its way down to that threshold in a gentle way that doesn't create a lot of distortion. Okay, so 30 milliseconds, it carves down to the threshold, and then the fast release, once it, you know, once it has hit the, the threshold, I'm sorry, once it's carved its way down <laughs> to the threshold, it then releases quickly and waits for the next kick, it goes up again. So this is another way you can shape your kicks, it's just a simple compressor with an attack time around 30 to 25 to 40 milliseconds, depending on the kick. And again, just look at it in an oscilloscope, play with your attack, play with your threshold, get it looking the way you want, like a Dorito chip. Okay, so just a couple ideas. Be aware that kicks and snares are the hardest thing because they're the loudest elements in the mix. And now we get to the how to do it and the, and the demos. So, you know, when I came over here and played this old school one for you, Let's go see what that actually looked like in the project it came from. This is my standard project template. It looks a little messy now because I've got some tracks and groups expanded out. I'll show you this in a minute when I actually walk you through the demo because we're going to recreate all this. But just to briefly show you what's going on here, um, I have a kick and a snare, and they are both hitting at... <laughs> exactly negative 12 peak, right? Old school gain staging. Set your kick and snare to peak at negative 12 and then blend everything else up into that anchor, that framework, right? And so the idea is that you usually have in every genre, there are certain sounds that are always the loudest sounds in every mix in that genre. If it's bass music, if it's electronic dance music, it's the kick, maybe also the snare. You know, techno often doesn't have a snare, so it's only the kick that counts, but something is the loudest sound. Uh, in pop music, it's the vocals. The number one sound in pop music is the vocals, and that is the loudest thing in your mix because they got to cut through nice and clear. Uh, in bass music, it's kick and snare, and then the vocals are right up there with the kick and snare. So I would consider if you have vocals in your song, it's also one of the, the anchor or framework sounds. Um, but the basic idea is you, you get your loud sounds at some level and then never touch those faders again until final mix down and mastering. And instead, you take every other sound, like this bass thing that's happening on Audio 4, and you set the fader so that this sound is balanced with your loudest anchor sounds. See, these are just sitting at fader zero over here. <laughs> So for this particular mix, that's where I needed to set the sound to sound balanced with the kick and the snare, okay? These are actually peaking lower than this sound. This sound, sound, the bass sound, has some occasional peaks that go above the level of these two sounds, but that's okay because the RMS is actually a little bit lower and I, you know, had to set things where they are. So this is typically how most most of you probably work. And then you get over to time to do mastering and you come over to the master and you start applying your, maybe your mastering compressor, if you use one. Uh, I'm gonna turn off the limiter temporarily and just let you hear the compressor. The basic idea with a mastering compressor, a bus compressor is to be very, very, very gentle with it because you're working on a whole mix by that point. 
And so typically you only want, you know, the, the gain reduction to dance when your loudest sounds hit. In this case, again, the kick and the snare. We want to see this thing dance a little bit and not really go much deeper than about negative one, right? Just a little bit of light shaping to crispen things up a little bit. That's gluing. It's gluing your mix together. It's emphasizing some of the, the punchy transients and sharpening them and making them a little more audible and, you know, reducing the fight of other things that happen right around those transients. And anyway, I'm going to toggle it on and off with this. You can hear the difference. Here's with it off. It's a very subtle difference. I'm not even sure you can really hear it on YouTube. It's really, really subtle. It took a while for me to really wrap my head around mastering compression. It's the lightest bit of glue compression. I mean, look at this ratio. It's like not even two to one, right? I've got about a 25 millisecond attack time, again, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to emphasize those initial transients of the, drum, of the kick and the snare, because they're a little compressed by this point. They're a little flat looking across the top. And so if you compare these two meters, this is before the mastering compressor, this is after. Now it's really hard to see at this zoom, they look exactly the same, but there's just, there's this tiniest bit of that same downward facing dig at the start of every kick and snare. And it's just gonna, it, it pushing all the other sounds that are happening, all the bass sounds that are happening at the same time, it's just crisping, crisping everything up, just a tinch. Just a little snappier, a little peppier, a little more open sounding, right? So very subtle thing. The point is, if you do something like this, I'm just showing you that I put one on here. But, you know, the real star of the show here for getting to loudness is, of course, the mastering limiter. So. I was able to push this particular signal by as much as, you know, crush those peaks down by 5 dB. And we're going to see a little picture of what it looks like now. Now that's pretty good shape. That's the kind of shape you typically want to see on your mastering limiter. If it's this whole sea of constant red down here, you're crushing too much and you're, you're taking all the, all the dynamics out of your mix entirely, which, you know, Okay, depending on the song, maybe. But let's do, um, let's turn on this gain compensation and let you hear it. I'm gonna pop it in and out and let you hear how I only pushed it enough that it was only slightly starting to hurt the kick and the snare and make them sound a little too different, a little too tubby. I'm finding that threshold where they start to fall apart and then I'm pulling back just a tiny bit. <laughs> Okay, sounds almost the same when I when I bypass the, the limiter, right? If I push this up higher, you're gonna start hearing things fall apart. And that's why I could only get to around negative 9.3 on this because trying to squash those anymore, this particular signal, by the time it gets up here, it just can't go any farther. So watch this. Hear how it suddenly got quieter? Everything got quieter. Everything got softer. Let me toggle it in and out. Okay, I know for a fact, many of you watching this video have run into this exact problem by the time you got to mastering. You wrote this incredible banger, you spent ages mixing it and designing it because you're slow at first and it's just like so much time, so much effort, so much sweat poured into it. And then you try and make it as loud as everyone else, as loud as your reference mixes, and you push this thing this far and it falls apart and you go, what is going on? I don't understand. All right, well, this is, this is what I spent three videos trying to teach you about. 
with, with this and these two about clippers, right? Certain sounds, certain mixes cannot survive the final crush to mastering loudness. So rather than be surprised when you get to this point, why not, why not actually work in a way that lets you figure all this out in the first place and fix it before you get to this point? Because to go back and fix this and actually get to your target loudness requires a whole ton of rework. And you may not even know how to approach it because everything's been set and you've spent so much time with it and you don't even know what to tweak, right? So this is the problem with the traditional approach. Um, so let's just walk through this from the get-go and show you what's different about the clip to zero approach. And I could show you the, the clip to zero project, right? And everything I did for, but let's just rebuild it from scratch because it's fast, it's simple, it's easy. It's a simple concept to apply. Okay, so we're gonna start with a brand new project. Uh, let's do it from my template, Pathy default. All right, bare bones vanilla template. First thing I need to do is turn off some of my monitoring compensation that'll completely mess up the video. Yeah, let's get rid of you too. All right. Um, it's, you know, stuff I put on to compensate my headphones and my speakers in my room um, and the, the level that I work at. So let's activate this audio engine. Now, just a super quick, I'm gonna do another video that really goes into my template and maybe you can get some ideas from the template. It looks intimidating, but it's not, it's not really. The basic idea here is that I have my, all my synthesized sounds, you know, all my, all my drop sounds, all my special funky weird glitchy interjections that get stuck into the drop with sidechain ducking, right? Uh, all of my melodic sounds, my chords, my pads, my melodies, my arps, and then all my atmospheric stuff, right? FX and risers and all that stuff. All of them are in one big group and they all sum together into a group bus called synths. And then here's my subs, here's my drums, and then all three of these things get summed together into another higher level bus called instrument, right? And then instrumental, I'm sorry, instrumental, Instrumental and vocals, vocals sits out here all by itself, and then vocals and instrumental both get summed into my pre-master, where I actually do a lot of my mix bus processing, right? This is where my mix bus chain is right here. And you can see, I'll give you a little preview of some of the goodies that they're all turned off by default, but I might, depending on the song, bring in any one of these. Gulf Foss is almost always added the rest of these, not so much, but Gulf Oss is amazing, so it's almost on every single mix. Um, but the point is, it's all off by default. And then this pre-master, right here, you can see it's being routed over to my master track. Okay, and then my master track actually doesn't go out to my monitors. Instead, I push it over to this monitoring bus, and this monitoring bus is what goes out to my studio speakers and headphones. Okay, so that's how I get monitoring after the master, and I don't have to remember to turn crap off just before, if I'm gonna burn a master or something. Um, so anyway, that's the quick, quick, quick tour. So let's start with uh, my drums. And I have by default, I have a drum generator that's all ready to go. It's using Reason Rack and a bunch of crazy controls to control Reason Rack. Uh, I like to use uh, drum sequencer in Reason Rack, and right now it's set to pattern number eight, which is just the standard dubstepy kick, snare, kick, snare, right? And since I tend to work at lower mid bass, mid tempo bass genres, right? You don't do it in halftime where it's kick and then snare here, and then the next bar is their next kick, and so on. Because this is a much slower tempo, I use common time kick and snare. So downbeat, backbeat, downbeat, backbeat. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So just by default, it's set up to use pattern eight, but I can grab this little thing and pick any of my other patterns or turn them off, right? I have a couple default patterns I work with, but I usually start out by making drops. So I start with just the basic empty kick and snare framework and uh, I go from there. And then 
reason rack is feeding into XO, which I've done videos about before, and I am literally using XO just as a sample browser. I love this space map. I love their method for um, letting you pick alternate samples and drag around in here to find drums of different types, and their, their filtering is great. What I don't use is any of the drum sequencer stuff. I do not edit these samples in here. I do not sequence these samples in here. I don't use any of the patterns that come with it, right? It's just a sampler. It's a, it's a drum machine with a really incredible sample browser built into it. Um, so I'm using it in a dumb way. It's an eight slot drum machine. Two kicks, a snare, a clap, a couple hi-hats, and a couple uh, sounds that I usually use for cymbals or shakers, right? So by default, there's something here so that I can basically open up my project and start playing. Right, it's, a bore, it's as boring as it gets. And I've even done some preliminary um, fixing of the kick and the snare to get them into my clip, uh, clip to zero <laughs> workflow, right? So here's th these, these kicks that come in out of EXO are actually shipped over to these tracks so I can burn them out into flattened samples. So where I really do all the processing is in my drums group, inside my kick and snare group, I've got a whole bunch of other drum things hiding in here from machine and a bunch of other things. This is just one of my drum sources. So it's in a, a group called From Reason Rack XO. So here's my kick and snare. And if we go on to the drum group and look at the oscilloscope, you can see I've got that nice Dorito ship shape to my kick and the snare. Now again, they didn't start out like this. I'm getting those shapes with these transient shapers, the, the kilohertz transient shaper, just like I showed you in the other video. If I turn off the transient shapers, right, now I get that big, mushy, boomy, already over-compressed kick and snare, right? So I'm doing some transient shaping um, for the kick. I'm also um, using a simple uh, uh, Bitwig tool device to pull the width in a little bit and make it a little more mono, because uh, this particular kick was a little too wide for my taste. And then, then we start the clip to gain stuff. So let's talk about clip to gain, because you'll notice both of these are hitting at zero. They're hitting right at the ceiling. They're not hitting at 12. So how's that work? What am I doing there? Uh, this is the full process in one slide, right? You can take notes, you can take screenshots, uh, whatever. But the basic idea is I find those framework sounds, those things that are always the loudest sound in the mix, that you mix everything else up into, you level everything else into this framework of your loudest sounds. You have to know what those framework sounds are for your genre, and then you set them up so they clip at zero, like I just showed you, right? In my case, since I do dance music and bass music mostly, that's almost always the kick and the snare. And if I am using vocals, when I add those to the project, one of the first things I'll do is solo them and do the same exact thing I'm about to show you on the vocal tracks too, okay? So that they're also peaking at zero. All of my framework sounds peak at zero, and then the other thing you have to do after getting them to peak at zero is then saturate or somehow drive the RMS of all those sounds up just to the point where they're starting to fall apart. That's the whole secret. So whether you saturate, whether you clip, whether you use something like Oxford Inflator, which is like a weird saturator that doesn't work like a saturator, uh, a lot of ways to increase that RMS and keep your peaks at a ceiling, and you combine those and do those on your th framework sounds until they're as loud as you can make them, right? Before they start falling apart somehow. And that's the limit, that's the threshold of your entire mix. You've already got your basic anchor sounds as loud as you can make them, right? And then you go through your project and add everything else, right? and you add all the new sounds and you level them up into this super loud framework. 
okay? Nothing's peaking over zero, but it's really freaking loud the whole time. No, no more turning up the master with a, a utility device because your, your track's so quiet, right? You can compare your mix against your reference mixes without having to balance the volume very much because it's already loud, just like your reference tracks, right? Um, and then you're occasionally looping back through the places where you set this clip to zero trick I'm about to show you, and you readjust the clip to zero so that you know, you're keeping every, all the buses and all the summing points running at zero, okay? And then when you're finally done and you're in your final mix down, you basically go through and replace some of the hard clippers because this whole trick revolves around hard clippers everywhere. And again, I went into tons of detail about clippers and why clippers and how to do clippers and how they're not bad. They're not something to be afraid of in some of these other videos right here. But the real story is at some point on tonal sounds, melodies, pads, chords, vocals, you probably don't want a clipper. You can use a clipper temporarily because it's almost the same sounding as a limiter. But at the end of the day, on tonal melodic waveforms, a limiter can be a tiny bit more transparent. So one of the things you do towards the end is walk through all your clippers, all the clippers you've got all over the project, and you replace some of them with limiters. You at least test it against the limiter and see if, if the limiter sounds slightly better. And a lot of times the difference is incredibly subtle. You can use either or. You could just say to hell with it and just do your whole project with clippers. And trust me, you'll be fine. It's really a subtle difference, okay? But the point is at some point you do replace some of those clippers with limiters. Everything's still peaking at zero all the way across your project. And then finally, by the time you get to mastering and you get to your mastering limiter, the main tricky thing I'm going to show you is that your loudness won't be any different, but you're, you're going to be, when you go through this process, you're going to have a certain level of loudness, but that loudness is also going to have a high true peak value with it. You're going to be, you're going to be having true peaks over zero, even though your, your actual sample peaks are stopping right at zero, okay? And so what you actually use the limiter for at the end of everything is to is to pull those true peaks down, but keep the RMS, keep the same level of loudness. And so I'm gonna show you this whole process, soup to nuts. So this is the part, it's a simple pattern. It's really easy once you wrap your head around it, All right? So we're gonna start with this kick in the snare. Um, they're already peaking at zero, so I effectively already did it, but we'll just redo it. So I have this, um, I have, dang it, come here. <laughs> All right, there we go. Get these front and center. So I have a, after my shaping, I want to take the resulting peak and push it up to zero, right? So I have this plugin again, and this is a free plugin. You don't have to pay any money for this. And what I do is I start out with it at no gain change and a reference level of zero. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open up the snare one. Whoops, wrong one. Gain zero on the snare. Damn it, come here. Okay. Um, so here's the kick, here's the snare. Let's reset the gain on this one. Okay. Now I'm gonna play these. Gonna let them measure for a minute. Okay. So the kick straight out of XO and then run through some of my early shaping is hitting at a negative 12 peak, negative 12.4. And the snare is hitting at negative 8.9. And all I want to do is make both of them hit exactly zero. So what do I do? I click this button, I click this button, and now this one's gained up 8.9, this one's gained up 12.4. and they're both peaking at exactly zero. I don't care about true peak yet. Don't even worry about true peak until you get to mastering. Just focus on the sample peak, okay? So now they're gained up, but now we want to see where they start falling apart. How loud can I make them, right? Their peaks are hitting zero, but can I make them even louder and keep the peak at zero? That's the whole trick, clip to zero. So I've set it to zero, but now I'm going to clip to zero. So let me open up these two hard clippers. There's my snare. 
snare. I can't tell which is my snare. Damn it. Come here. All right, there's my snare. So <clears throat> I don't touch the faders. You're going to see that these meters never change from zero because the way a clipper works, and I like GVST G Clip for this, G Clip by GVST, it's a free clipper. Go get it. It's free. It's wonderful. I like GVST, number one, because it sounds good. Number two, because it has a, a variable amount of softness. If I want softness, it lets me independently either clip downward into the signal or leave the, the ceiling all the way up at zero at 100% and instead push the signal up into the ceiling, right? And the clip to zero technique, you never clip downward. You never go this way. You always leave it at ceiling because you've set the ceiling to zero with this little gain zero already. It's already at zero and I want to keep it at zero, but now I want to drive the signal into the ceiling and clip the peaks off the top. And the other reason I like this plugin is because you, you got this little window here that lets you actually see the peaks you're shaving. Uh, and I usually only do one side, it's left and right channels. I usually don't bother with the bottom one, but for your sake, I'll put it down here for now. So I can see the limits or the ceiling of this clip value, right? And it matches zero dB peak. So when I play these, you can see the kick is going right to the ceiling, the snare is going right to the ceiling. So now I'm gonna clip them. Let's do the kick first. We're just gonna solo the kick. Okay, now you can hear that's obviously hurting the kick. It's making it way too tubby and flabby. Turn it off. Turn it on. Right, that's obviously way too tubby and flabby. So I can't push it that far, but I can push it a little bit. So let's figure out exactly how far to push it. Now, for this, honestly, the best way to do it is to find yourself a plugin that lets you automatically equalize the loudness before and after and let you AB. It's hard to explain, so let me just show you. This is the one I use, ABLM. This is by the same people who make um, that DP Meter 4 that I told you about. Now, DP Meter 4 is free. This one's like $40. It's fairly cheap. Um, but the basic idea here is you put in two instances of it, and the second instance is always the one that controls the first instance, which is a transmitter, right? It's a before and after kind of thing. And so what you do is you put the transmitter in front of the thing you want to double check. And then you use this. And this button here basically just listens to it with the effect in the middle or as if this effect were bypassed. But it keeps both of them at the same volume. That's the whole trick here. So what I'm going to do is leave this engaged. And now it's going to, no matter how far I push this up and increase the volume, this will automatically keep pulling the volume down to match the signal that's happening right before it hits that first listener portion of it, right? So check it out. Okay, see I didn't get any louder, so you can accurately hear what's actually happening. You're not being fooled by louder is better or brighter is better. Um, so you can really accurately set things with a tool like this. So what I'm gonna do is push it up until I think I've found that threshold where it's breaking apart, and then I'm gonna A, B it on and off with this button. Okay, I'm thinking 2 dB of clipping, just a little bit of those peaks at the top and the bottom there, are, is pretty transparent. Let's listen to it A, B now. Here's without it, and with it. Right, very transparent. So, 
I feel confident I can clip this kick about this much, right? Without changing its timbre in any significant way. So what have I done? I have given myself two full dB of extra RMS. I clipped it by two. I pushed the RMS up into the ceiling, right? Because I'm pushing those peaks up through the zero dB ceiling and it's still zero dB. Well, if I take off the ABLM, it is. Let's, uh, this is how you turn off the ABLM. So you're gonna see it hits at zero. Right? But if I turn off the hard clipper, it's gonna be slightly quieter. There's actually two full RMS more in that, in that thing now. So now, let's just move these since I'm working on the snare next. I'm just gonna drag the listener in front of the hard clipper on the snare. I'm gonna drag the receiver after the hard clipper. And now I can do the same thing with this one, which is on my snare. And we'll just open up this one again and let it adjust for a second. Oops, let's actually also solo the snare. Okay, that's completely transparent. I've, I've just kicked up the RMS of the snare by two. Can't hear a difference at all. I could actually go farther, but I'm just gonna stop here just to keep, keep the video moving. So I've now set my kick and my snare. Uh, let's go ahead and delete these, right? And they're still gonna peak at zero, but they're both louder now. All right, kick and snare done now. Because I increased the level on these a little bit, I'm just gonna double check their first summing group here. It's still hitting zero. I'm gonna go up to the next group. It's still hitting zero. And I'm just gonna quickly check that my little thing that you know controls it at zero isn't reading something over zero. I'm just doing a quick double check. Right, so. They're set at zero. They're not summing with anything else yet. They're not summing with each other because they're separated out. So I don't really have to check anything up the chain. Everything's staying at zero all the way up to the pre-master. So I'm done with kicking the snare. Let's just collapse this group up. Uh, in fact, let's just collapse all the drums up and work on the synth sound now. So to keep things really simple, I'm just gonna use a uh, sample loop for this. It's a simple bass chop. Um, I'm gonna put in an audio track. Let's go find the sample. Let's see. <laughs> Let me turn this down so I don't blow your ears out. So here's the sample I wanna use. <laughs> So you can see this sample is at 174 BPM. My project is at 90, so I'm gonna have to do some warping when I bring it in, no big deal. Uh, let's also flip over to our clip launcher view and just play it out of here, because that's simpler. So we're gonna drop it here in the audio four. Then I'm gonna select the sample. I'm gonna change it from raw to Elastic Pro, which is a really, really good stretching algorithm. And the original clip sample is 174. I'm at 90. So 174 is really close to 80. 80 is half of 90. So I'm just going to cut this in half. So what is that? Uh, 87. So I'm going to set the tempo to be 87. And then I'm going to set it to loop. And I'm going to make the loop two bars long. And now the sample fills out and it's a perfect little two bar loop that sounds like this. Okay, now it's a little too loud compared to the kick and the snare. It's also peaking over zero. This thing's really freaking loud for some reason, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> what I'm gonna do 
is first um, leave the fader where it is, but I'm going to drop a gain zero on here. And since I have these gain zero and hard clip devices all over my project, I'm just going to copy this one over. Just click control drag in and then click that one and control drag in. Oh, damn it. I don't want Pro-Q3. You have to click first to make sure you actually selected it. All right. So gain to zero followed by a hard clip. So <clears throat> we're going to um, first set the gain to zero. So I'm just gonna play this for a second. Okay, so it's peaking out at three. I click the M, it reduces the gain by three. So now it is gonna hit zero. Except do I have a hard clipper set here? No, nope, what's going on? One more time. Let's try this again. Is that right, is that right? Now it's peaking under. Oh, I'm not letting it play all the way. There we go, right? It's that one dive at the end. <laughs> it goes all the way up to zero. Okay, so now, now we want to test it again to figure out where it starts falling apart if we start clipping it. Because if we look at this waveform, let's use the synths one for this. You know, we got some peaky things above the main. You know, we have some peaks. So we can we can cut down the dynamic range on this, and it's a very bright, distorted sound anyway, so clipping distortion is gonna be hidden, mostly. So let's do this trick again where we bring in ABLM. Bring in the first one, bring in the second one, it automatically sets itself up. It's really, really smart that way. Okay. And put this one on the other side of the clipper going to keep it engaged. We're going to watch the oscilloscope sitting up here on its parent synth track, and we're just going to run the, run the clipper until we start hearing it fall apart a little bit. So. Okay, here how it's starting to sound a little crispy up here. That's the distortion because it's so much clipping going on, right? But back around here somewhere, it still sounded pretty transparent. So let's find that sweet spot. Okay, I think 6.6 .6 is probably going to be transparent. Now look how much we're clipping. This is the same thing a mastering limiter would be doing if you waited until the end for mastering and be shaving this much off. But let's see what it sounds like. We're going to A, B it on and off now. Can you hear any difference? I can't. But look how controlled the RMS is on this. It's a sausage, right? compared to... Right, look at this. So again, don't be afraid of clippers. They're really clean if you don't overdo them. You just find that spot where they start breaking the sound apart, and then you pull it back a little bit, and you double check it with something like a tool like ABLM, and uh, good to go. So we've made this sound as loud as it can be. I'm gonna take off the ABLMs. Delete, delete, and now we'll double check where it's actually peaking on the meter. Right? It's not going over zero. It's as loud as we can make it. Now we're going to balance it against the kick and the snare. So let's unsolo it. All right. Now, can you hear how that's probably too loud for this mix?
Here how it's masking the kick and the snare a little bit. It's really competing with the kick and the snare. If we actually look at a higher level bus where, the, where both the drums and the synths are summing together, um, like here at the instrumental bus, and we look at this oscilloscope, look at that big fat sausage. And in fact, that reminds me, this is, this is the part of <laughs> this thing. You set your kick and snare to clip to zero, and then you start adding other sounds, but you periodically have to check all the summing points where all your new sounds sum together and you have to readjust the clip to zero at those summing points. So that's the other nuance here. I've got this audio happening inside drop sounds. Drop sounds is part of synths. Synths is still hitting at zero, right? Nothing's going on with synths. It's still peaking at zero. Nothing is clipping. See, no clipping. But if I go one level higher where my synths are now summing with my drums on the instrument bus, now if we go look at the clip to zero or the gain zero plugin, look at that, it's peaking at 6 dB over zero. Now the reason it still looks at zero here on the, on the meters is because I've got a hard clipper sitting there like a safety limiter waiting to clip everything. And it is, it's clipping by 6 dB. Look at that. All that clipping. So we don't necessarily want that much clipping. So let's, let's do the clip to zero trick. On the place where these two signals sum together, I'm just gonna use this utility and go boink. And now, it's coming in at zero before it gets to the hard clipper. So if I open up the hard clipper now, nothing's going past zero anymore and nothing's being clipped. But this gives us a clue that some clipping is possible. Look at those big spiky caterpillar legs. Right? And this fat sausage of the bass is summing with the kick and the snare and that's what's making those peaks so big. So let's do a couple things. First things first, remember this slide that talked about loudness? And we talked about one of the tricks is to do ducking to checkerboard high RMS sounds side by side. We haven't done ducking yet, so let's go do that real quick. Um, the bass sound is here on this drop sounds group. Everything rolls up to the synth group, and on the synth group, I have a ducker for my kick and the snare. It's turned off by default because I don't want that stuttery thing when I'm picking sounds, right? So what I'm going to do is just come over here to the synth track, turn on the ducker. It's a, it's a rack, and it's got basically all kinds of tricks in here when I need to time shift and stuff, but mostly I just care about this ducker for the kick and the snare. So let's turn on the kick ducker and set the kick... Do I want to take the time to do it one by one with you? I'm almost sure this is correct, just from looking at it and thinking about it, because this is already set up for my kick and snare that I use by default in the project. But eh, let's show you. Sure, let's do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solo the kick. Let's blow this out, blow this out, find the kick. Let's solo the kick. And then let's also come over to the sense group and solo this track. So now I'm listening to these two together. And you're hearing that stuttering because the snare ducker is on, so let me just temporarily turn the snare off. Okay, it sounds seamless. The kick, the kick and, the, and the thing are, are you know, really cleanly ducking with each other. If you want to be sure though, and if I make this longer, it's going to get gappier. Hear that, that hesitation before the bass comes in? That's pretty much the seamless part. And I could play with this envelope, but I also know that's a pretty good duck for this particular kick. Um, and we can see it on the sense group if we look at the, actually let's go up a level to 
to the instrument group and look at that oscilloscope here. <laughs> So look how high the kick is sitting, just above this line. Now if I turn off the ducker, you're hiding here. Okay, if I turn off this whole ducking rack, but we're still looking at the instrumental group and the oscilloscope there. See how the kick comes all the way to the ceiling and beyond? But when I turn on the ducker again, see how those kick transients have fallen down quite a bit? Now, again, you can't ever get it perfect. There's a, there's a balance point between too much gap or weirdness you can hear versus how much you're shaving things down in the oscilloscope. Right, that's too much of a gap. Eh, right? Let's try a different shape. Now, this one is interesting. There's the kick. It's barely humping up over the bass. Right? It's blending really smoothly with the bass. This is basically the original Dorito. Here's the bass sausage inside of it. And so it's only humping up here with this kind of ducking shape and length. The problem is, even though this is great from a RMS point of view and getting maximum loudness and time slicing things next to each other, checkerboarding the sounds, you can hear it. Listen to the, to the way this sounds. <laughs> There's a slight swell up or suck up of the bass after the kick. And so that's why I say you can only go so far with your ducker. You want to get as much reduction and, and clean up of your RMS to peak as you can, but you can never make it perfect when you're summing sounds together. You just want to minimize the damage with a ducker, and then the rest of it's going to be done with a clipper or limiter somewhere down the road. So this is pretty much the one that sounds best to my ears, and also tends to have about the right, uh, the best overall effect here. And again, if I turn off the ducker, see how some of those kicks are way up at the ceiling? Wait, let's turn this one. So I'm gonna let the clippers do the rest of the work, okay? So that's your, that's your ducking. We've done as much of the ducking part of this as we can, okay? Um, so let's turn off all these solos and let's collapse some things again just for cleanness. All right, so over here on the instrument bus again, we've got it. Um, we're gonna double check the clip to zero one more time because I changed things because of this ducking. Let's actually reset this too. Alt click will just clear out the game. Okay, so now we're back down to zero. Uh, before we get to the clipper, now let's play the game again. This, when we look at the oscilloscope on this track, and let's make sure we're looking at the right track. Right, we can see the kick is still sitting up above the bass sausage quite a bit. And the snare. Look how high the snare is. There's definitely some potential for clipping here. And again, like I talked about in my earlier videos about clippers, every time you sum, you're creating new bigger peaks. And a lot of those peaks can be transparently shaved and you want to do that. You want to do lots of little clips all through your cascade from your individual tracks up through the intermediate summing groups to the final master group. If you wait to clip everything on the master just one time, there's a lot more, um, harmonic distortion that happens from that. 
It's not as clean sounding, so you take little bits and bites all the way up the chain. So that's what we're gonna do here with, with this clipper on the instrument bus, where the synth sound and the drum sounds are summing together. So here's our clipper. Oh, and we're gonna do our trick with ABLM again. Helps if I am in the right spot for this. Instrument bus. Let's just go back to my mixing view. All right. Okay. Uh, right here. Okay, there's the first one. Drop in the second one. The hard clipper back up open. Let's move the listener in front of the hard clipper and the receiver after the hard clipper. Okay, so now I can really clearly hear what this clipper is going to be doing to the signal down here in the oscilloscope. And I can also see it in the oscilloscope as I drive the clipper up into the sound. <laughs> Okay, you hear how that much clipping is starting to soften the snap of the kick and the snare just a little bit. This is too much clipping. The bass is handling it fine because it's not touching the bass, but it's definitely softening the kick and the snare just a little too much. So I'm going to pull this way back and be really gentle with it. Let's try it. Right around one or just a little under one dB of time. So that's about as much as I'm going to do. I got about uh, almost a, a almost a dB of RMS back. That's very transparent. So now we've done everything all the way up to the final summing before it gets pushed over to the master because nothing new is happening over here on the pre-master. And I'm not going to do any, um, I'm not going to use any of my mixing plugins for this. We're just going to do it really dry just to keep this as short as possible because this is already a chewy, chewy subject. So what I did was I moved those two ABLMs over here to the master bus because this is where we're going to finish up. And... Um, Let's make sure this is on and we can hear it. And now we're just going to focus on the two mastering plugins. I'm going to engage the clipper, I'm sorry, the uh, mastering compressor and set it up. And then I'll engage the limiter and we'll see what we can get to. So first, let's start with Unison. Let's go ahead and load it up and get it open and get where I can see things. All right. <laughs> Well, first thing we need to do is make sure that the master is also clipping at zero because it's clearly not for some reason. Well, maybe I'll, um, let's go here. Okay, give me just a sec. All right. Am I just hitting it too hard with this clipper? I mean, this compressor? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I think I just have my threshold too high. I like to start with the attack closer to 25-ish. That's what's wrong. I, I wish I could make this stay on the VU meter because that's the one that dances the way I like to see things. Okay, and uh, I'm keeping the channels unlinked because I also like to let the stereo image move around a lot. So let's turn this on and off and you can hear what it sounds like. Don't worry about this because ABLM is a little imprecise and it'll let it drift a tiny bit. So it's okay when this is, stays close to zero. 
Hear how this just snaps it up a little bit, gives a little more punch, a little more bite. Listen really close to just the first couple hits. Um, this is with it off. Eh, and this gain at zero is gonna, well, you're hearing a little bit of distortion now too. <laughs> Normally what I would do here is pull this way down. In fact, just let me do it. Let's put this about negative eight. I shouldn't have to do that. Let's stick this back at zero again. I think it's just because I'm hitting some buttons I shouldn't. Right, that's at zero, and this should also be at zero. Right, okay, I don't know what I hit. Anyway, point is, listen to it off. This is off. On. This is why we use mastering compressors. When you, when you wrap, I'm afraid to do videos about mastering compressors. It took me so long to figure this stuff out, but when you have a mastering compressor set up right, look, it's doing a tiny, tiny ratio. No makeup gain. It, it, it's amazing. They're just amazing. They can, they can really open up your mix and really add some punch. But the point is, this is set up correctly now. It's improving the signal ever so slightly, giving a little bit of bite. So now, we do the final bit, which is Pro L2. And again, we're gonna keep using ABLM while we set Pro M2. Let's get things where we can see them. So I tend to really like the modern algorithm. Um, a lot of people don't understand what these buttons do. They think this is the attack of the limiter, but it's not. <laughs> and it's really terribly named. They never should have called it this. Both of these knobs have to do with the release time and curve and when the release kicks in. This is the attack. Yeah, it's weird. Um, maybe another video, I'll talk about that. But I like to set it up so that it is almost clipping and is letting 150 milliseconds of like hold time for the fast clipper to just jiggle up and down on every single wave that it sees for 150 milliseconds. And if it, if it basically has 150 milliseconds where it hasn't found a new signal to clamp down on like a brick wall clipper, then it allows the release envelope to kick in. So it's sort of like, it'll let it be all jiggly and, and precise and then after it doesn't need to be jiggly and precise anymore, then it will do this slow release curve of everything else. And this is how long the release curve actually is and the shape of it. In a nutshell, that's what's going on here. It's hard to describe. Um, but anyway, we'll see what it looks like up here. Oops, and let me do compensation. You'll notice again, I've got an output ceiling of negative one true peak. I am doing true peak limiting, which is a real challenge for super loud genres, but let's see if we can get there. And I feel like ABLM is freaking out on me. I guess, yeah, I guess I just have to talk about it. There we go. Okay, so actually, you know what? I'm just gonna take ABLM off at this point because I forget Pro L2 has its own excellent uh, loudness compensation built into it. That's this little yellow one-to-one. -one. So now I toggle it on and off here and it's gonna be gain matched for limiting or not. Okay, you can see when I hit about five, it starts mushing up the kick in the snare. See how the kick and the snare just get too soft at five? So five is obviously too much. I'm not going to be able to get that loud. Let's find the sweet spot. Okay. 
and I'm mostly listening to the kick and the snare because they're the only thing hitting the limiter. So they're the thing that's going to change the most. Okay, right about here, 4.3 is where it's starting, starting to soften. So I'm just going to pull it back a little bit. Let's just try 4.2. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, let's see where we're at now for luffs. I'm gonna reset this. Boom, and there it is, 7.3. I can live with that. It's not seven exactly, but damn, it's really close. And I haven't killed this sound much at all, right? So this is the uh, clip to zero production strategy. I know it's a lot to wade through. I know this was a long one. It's chewy, but if you watch it, rewatch it, think about these slides and experiment with some of these techniques yourself, I think you'll find it's a heck of a lot easier to make your mixes and masters without any fuss or surprises at the end. Thank you very much for hanging with me. And uh, I'll see you next time. I think of something to share. Bye-bye.